Mary Kennedy, our special guest for today, letter to say a few words to us, and um, that that will wind up. In case any of you are anxious to see what time to leave at, but very, you're very welcome. And uh, I leave it over to you. And I know it's kind of late, so I, I, if anybody has to go, please feel free. Don't don't worry about um, having to walk out. Um, but it's lovely to be here. Um, we were chatting outside, um, and somebody was saying, you know, um, would this be a, a normal time to be starting off? And yes, it would. Seven o'clock in the morning would be, but we wouldn't have to have a face on and be dressed up. <laughs> so that normally happens. And then somebody said, you probably have a team to do that. No, 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 no. Uh, it's all a uh, solo um, thingy. The, the makeup is usually put on in the rearview mirror in the car. <laughs> so networking is a really nice concept to be dealing with here this morning. Um, uh, I, I know from uh, people in the parish that I you know, am involved with in, in other groups that uh, the Notline Network is a very vibrant uh, enterprise. And um, it's something that I was thinking about, it's something that's very new to me because uh, when I was growing up, networking was the last thing anybody did. We actually were very secretive, parse people. And we didn't share and we didn't get the support that you can from, from kind of networking with people. I mean, um, uh, Eugene asked me to speak about the, 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 the path that I took to become a television presenter. And number one, I am the most unlikely television presenter that you would ever find because I was painfully shy as a child, and I still am shy. And I, I do step outside my comfort zone all the time. But you just, I just park it, and I can control it and all of those things. But uh, I was so shy that my, uh, my mother sent me to, um, well, it's speech and drama now, it used to be elocution classes, and also to Irish dancing classes, just so you get out there. Um, I couldn't ask for anything in a shop, I couldn't do anything like that. So, um, and uh, it just wasn't, there, there wasn't an outward looking and a sharing um, reality to community when I was growing up. I mean, say that now both my parents were really involved in the community in Clondalkin. So, to the extent that um, when I decided that I would like to answer this ad in the paper to become a continuity announcer, first of all, I said to myself, absolutely not a chance. But I said, I am telling nobody about this. And I didn't. And I, my, I didn't even tell uh, my parents. I really wasn't even sure where RTE was. But I went and I answered the ads. And it was a very <coughs> slow process, which went on over several um, piece, you know, pieces with interviews and camera tests and all the rest. Um, and I suppose the, the elocution probably stood to me. But um, I, I used this thing, which I have used so many this, I suppose, strategy that I've used so many times uh, over the, the 41 years. And it's a, it's, I didn't know what it was called then, but I now know from um, being involved in therapy groups and everything that it's visualization. And I visualize myself uh, standing in front of the cameras and you know presenting, and I wanted to do that. So I kind of just pushed forward. But again, um, I really feel that if there was this, if I had to have that um, feeling of being part of a community and being involved would have helped. I also feel that there's something else I had which uh, I stood me to good stead while I was starting off in, um, in RTE and that was the fact that I was doing it part-time but that I was actually a teacher by, uh, by trade and um, the, I, the reason I applied in the first place was that because all through college when I was uh, studying to be a teacher, I, I worked part time. So I said, Well, and with respect to Sheila and other teachers, <laughs> and I was a teacher myself, I said, What am I going to do for the rest of the day when I start teaching? <laughs> so I said, I'm going to have to have something to do part time or I'll walk my head. <laughs> a part-time continuity announcer. Um, now I know I also have a daughter who's a teacher that they work very hard and I work very hard as a teacher but I, I did used to bring in my copies into RT and I'd be correcting them when, <laughs> when the programs were on in between the announcements. Um, but uh, I had this attitude I think from the, ver from the word go um, that look if they give me a contract next year that's great I'd love it but I always had the teaching in my back pocket. And I think that's something that I always say to uh, 
pupils and students when I'm, I'm talking to them. It's very nice to have something that you can fall back on, as they used to say. And that, I suppose, was probably the, the equivalent of the Not Lion Network nowadays, because I had something that kind of was my support <coughs> and my aid to having that attitude of, well, if it works, fine, and if it doesn't, I have somewhere else to go for, 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 for money, but also for support. And that is the value of people sharing and helping and networking with each other. I feel it's very, very valuable and very, um, very important. Um, the, the, and I, I think that's why, you know, I never went looking for anything uh, right through my career. It came to a point where uh, it was getting difficult. I had uh, four children and also there were more opportunities coming along. But I think the mindset was there of, I can always leave this to one side. Uh, and then I just kept getting the contracts. And then the Eurovision came along. Now that's the other thing that um, I also speak about when I'm talking in, in schools. Because people say, oh gosh, you know, it's, it's lovely to do the Eurovision and something, uh, weren't you really lucky? I mean, I got, uh, to present the Eurovision, which was an absolute highlight of my career uh, in 1995. But it was my third attempt. It was my, I, I auditioned for it twice and didn't get it. So there was the, the kind of the disappointment and the putting yourself out there. And again, this kind of secretive thing that I had about not wanting, well, I suppose it was a fear of rejection. And I did have to suffer the rejection <coughs> twice. But again, I fell back on the visualization, and I had visualized myself, um, well, being involved in the Eurovision, and there's no way I would have been singing in the Eurovision, and uh, if you hear me at four o'clock in the morning, uh, you would know that. Uh, so I had really got this dream of the Eurovision since I saw Dana winning um, in 1970. I just said, oh my God, that is such, that is fabulous. Um, so I applied. I was rejected. I applied, I was rejected, and then the third time, I kept doing this visualization, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And I don't know whether in 1995, because it was the, the third year in a row that it was coming from um, Ireland, that uh, I don't know whether they felt sorry for us, that Jesus, we better go to it this year, or she'd be knocking on our door forever. But um, it was wonderful, and it did open so many doors, and um, as a result, now I, I work full time in uh, RTE and it has been uh, an amazing journey. It has given me uh, access to um, a huge variety of experiences from my, my, well, it introduced me to the developing world because um, I was asked two years after the Eurovision to do the commentary for the funeral of Mother Teresa in Calcutta and that was my first time it was um, a life-changing experience to be landed in Calcutta to see the abject poverty and to see also the, the devout nature of all the religions and the way they were mourning this, um, this tiny woman. And um, uh, like it was a culture shock because the, the stench, the fact that at that time there were 18 million people living in Calcutta and 5 million of them, which is just kind of more or less the population of Ireland, were living on the streets. And you literally couldn't go from here to the door without stepping over people. Uh, to see people, um, you know, foaming up the water, putting soap into the water in the gutters that was uh, poured down early in the morning to kind of clean um, the gutters. And then they were putting their soap and their washing up liquid into they were washing their... Uh, they're cooking utensils, they're washing themselves, men standing up washing themselves in the gutter and washing their teeth in the gutter and then heading off to work. That was absolutely uh, life changing for me and I, I really do have um, an amazing, um, I suppose, connection with um, the developing world and I've travelled many, many times to Africa and Sri Lanka and India and it really gives me a purpose. Um, also. Uh, there was uh, one of, we, we travelled a few times with the uh, Defence Forces to do maybe Christmas programmes or St. Patrick's Day programmes. And the first time I travelled with the Defence Forces, I got this huge insight into something that I think we in ourselves take for granted, and that is our sense of community. It really is remarkable the way Irish, I think it's part of our DNA that we just. Um, have a concern for, for people. It's, 
you know, it's the Shannachal, it's a Scotchail or War Medina. It really applies to Irish people. We were in Liberia, and Liberia was a hellhole. It was absolutely awful. And we were with the Defence Forces in their camp, which was, they were based in the old um, Hotel Africa, where Charles Taylor used to bring all his fancy visitors. And it was a beautiful resort at one point, and I was in bits. And uh, they shared this camp with the Swedish uh, contingent of the, the, the UN Defence Forces. Um, they had a, we had a generator, there was nothing you could do outside of the camp after dark because there was no electricity in, in Monrovia, there was no transport, there was nothing. It was um, absolutely awful and they did have their challenges. But obviously because they are Defence Forces they, they have to have their time off. And we went off with our uh, running order of what we were going to film, we were going to do their carol service, we were going to you know, have pieces from their families at home and all that sort of stuff. But when we got there, just in conversation with them, said, well, what do you do on your, your downtime? And um, it was obvious what the Swedish people did. The, there were men and women, mostly men in the Swedish uh, forces. And you weren't allowed outside, it was a dry camp. So uh, they, uh, there was a gym. And every time you went by this gym, you'd see loads and loads of these, um, you know, gorgeous Swedish <laughs> men working out. And you would also uh, see them watching videos. They played cards, they played Jenga, they played Scrabble, all of those things. Um, that was the way they used their <coughs> time in a, you know, in, a, in a sociable way. And I said to the, the Irish guys, and, and do you do the same? They said, well, we do. But also, during their working hours, they had gone out and they had discovered other needs. And what they did was they had adopted two charities, just, just because. And one of them was um, an orphanage which was being run by two orphans themselves, young men in their 20s who had been orphaned during um, the, the, the war. Um, and they had taken in all of these waifs and strays. Um, but the, the Irish uh, Defence Forces on one of their visits there discovered that the boys' dormitory, that the gable end wall actually wasn't a gable end wall at all, it was a termite hill and so the, the poor children were being bitten and scratched and itchy the whole time. So the, the Irish Defence Forces said, okay, this is going to be our project and they built um, a, a new dormitory that, that was part of their, their job. They built a new dormitory in their spare time uh, for, the, the, uh, for the, the orphanage, for these guys. And then the other one was uh, a Mother Teresa, it was a mother, I, can't, I don't know what her order is called, um, but anyway, it was the Mother Teresa nuns, and they were running a hospice for the dying in Monrovia. Now that was awful, 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 awful. There was a, on the first top floor, there was a men's ward, and in the middle there was a women's ward, and then on the ground floor, there were the children of those people, um, who had to be minded and uh, looked after. The men, first, the first thing that would hit you was the, the stench of death and dying when you got in there. Um, there were people queuing up outside, A, trying to get in, or B, trying to get in to, to feed their families or to look after them. Um, but, and again, the Irish Defence Forces said, okay, this is gonna be one of our projects as well. And on their time off, they would go to this place they would talk to the, the men, they would wash them, they would uh, bring sweets. I remember uh, one guy coming in with open fruits and sitting beside a man who was within days of dying. And you know, even the colour of the packet was, was something unusual for this man. Uh, the, women, the women soldiers did the same with the women and they also were feeding and playing with the children downstairs. And that they organised a roster for themselves for their time off of doing this. And it just struck me, I said, I went back to the, um, the director and I said, look, we're going to have to include this in our programme. And we did. And as a result, and the, again, it's an illustration of the sense of community that we have, they were able to fundraise back home to get money to uh, support the two charities that they were working with in Monrovia. I just felt, and I, with, with, again, with respect to the, the Swedish forces in their downtime, they chose to do that. But not one of them, having chatted with our guys and women um, in their downtime, said, well, look, I'm free at the same time as you, I'll go along and do it. It just didn't register with them, but it brought it home so strongly to me, the sense of community that we have as Irish people. And I think we don't really 
um, give ourselves enough credit for it. We don't, we just take it for granted, which is good, but I think we really should um, uh, acknowledge that we are very good at that. That was a real highlight for me working. And I suppose then the work that I do now with Nationwide is a further illustration of that because I am blown away every time I go down the country and you see, uh, particularly during the recession, because I joined Nationwide in 2004 and I went right through the recession and now it's coming on the upturn again. But I can tell you, not every part of our country is enjoying you know, the, the fresh shoots and the, the, the regrowth. It's very, very um, slow and not happening in certain parts. But you get small groups um, which are, you know, just taking on board the needs of their own community and the, uh, the, the, the reaching out that's very much a part of us and it, it's definitely um, happening. We love to showcase it on, net, on, on Nationwide. We love to, uh, when we get, which we do, uh, go to a community and say, oh yeah, well, we saw something on Nationwide and we said, well, why can't we do that? And that really, I think, has happened in particular with the whole men's sheds movement because um, I can remember about four years ago going down to Dungarvan and talking to these men um, and they had started a men's shed and there weren't many in the country now, but now it's a, it's a burgeoning group. It's really, really um, enormously powerful, enormously important and enormously successful. Um, and obviously likewise with the women's groups, but I suppose we're just, um, uh, men were uh, probably like me, a little bit less um, inclined to, to reach out and the, the men's shed movement is such a wonderful um, asset to a community. Um, so those are the, the things that strike me about um, the, the, the way we live our lives. I think networking, is hugely important. I am a very late, if you like, arrival to networking. I just avoid avoided it for so many years because I, I don't know, I just felt, um, oh, people will only think I'm doing this so that I can gain something out of it. I think it's wonderful for sharing. I love the, um, the, the fact that businesses are supported and just given a leg up and an opportunity to present. Um, and also then, you know, to make us realise that the services are there for us to, um, to, to avail of. Um, also to, to be conscious of, um, of what's in our community and to support it. It's like going back to the time when there was only the local shop. Um, I can remember growing up, as I said, my parents were really deeply involved in the community. There was the ICA, the plan giving, the winter and the year, all of those things. But also, the, I suppose there was no choice but to go to the butcher and the, the grocer and all of those things. Now we do have choice, but it's so important to, to support the local communities. And we say it as often as we can on Nationwide. Uh, shop local, buy local, if you want to buy a gift, go to the local craftsperson, services, all of those things. So um, that's all I have to say. I'm really conscious of the time. I hope I haven't kept you too long. But I do um, applaud um, the, the work <coughs> of uh, the Knockline Network and all of the, uh, the community groups and the volunteers. It's just, uh, we have a, a culture of volunteerism in this country and I know that the, the, the culture of volunteerism is really, really strong in Knockline. So, Mila Buechus, as an gwerra o gwrt thomsa tach an so ar maiden, agus gwnairi gwgyal le na hain grupa agus leis an network a shilmach. Gwrmach.